We have got a new version of Substance Designer today, and I want to talk to you about some of the really cool features that I'm interested in, and I think that could really help you in your workflow. Substance Designer 2020.2 has a plethora of new improvements and features. And if you want to see all of the new features, check out the description box below. I've left a couple links where you can check out their videos and also their official blog magazine post for your perusal. Perusal? Is that a word? For you to, for you to peruse. In this video, I'd like to show you a couple of demo substances that I've created while messing with the new features and explain to you some of the things that I'm excited about with this new release. Okay, so what do we have here? Well, here's a simple desert ground, sort of rocky material that I'm working on, and I'm gonna use it to demonstrate some of the new features and how they're useful. By the way, I'm gonna be skipping around a bunch here instead of building the whole graph from scratch like I usually do. I'm gonna make these graphs available on Gumroad where you can download them, mess with the new nodes, and play around with the parameters and new features. Okay, so I've switched to OpenGL to make things go a bit smoother here. Now, the first thing I wanna look at here is the tile comparison frame that I've made here. I've got the tile generator and the tile sampler. Right from the beginning, I'm betting some of you are wondering what the difference is between the two. Theoretically, they're both used for similar purposes. Take a bunch of elements like squares, circles, patterns, and repeat them over and over again. Both have a useful list of parameters, but the tile sampler has a vast amount of inputs. These allow you to direct exactly what you want to do with these parameters. You might think, well, this is great, then I'll just use the tile sampler for everything, right? Well, hold your horses. While the tile sampler does have more flexibility, if I toggle on the compute times, you'll see that the tile generator computes a lot faster than the tile sampler. That's useful to keep in mind if you plan on using a bunch of these, or if you're developing textures for games where it requires a specific, usually small amount of memory or loading times. All of this to say, both of these nodes gained a neat improvement with this update. If you double click either one of them and you go to the size parameters, you'll notice the new size mode dropdown. Now you can specifically tell the node to keep the ratio of specific tiles, predefine a percentage of the final image's width, or how define how large a specific tile is based on pixels. In this example, I chose the absolute size mode option. So I could specifically choose what I was looking for on the width and height of the particular tile based on a percentage of the entire texture here. After the tile generator, we've got an edge detect. Now it's taking this crazy pattern of squares and providing a more simpler one that I can input into the newly updated distance node. Now I would go as far as to say the distance node is one of the most important nodes in your arsenal. It takes a shape and expands it until it reaches another shape. You'd often find that people would use this to create a Voronoi pattern or some sort of organic cellular shape. Originally, this was done with something called the Euclidean distance mode, which found a straight line between both points. But now you have two more options here in this new distance mode section. You can choose Manhattan and also Chebyshev. Manhattan constrains the distance of two points on a grid. The Chebyshev mode is similar, but a little bit different. It finds the maximum distance from the difference of two points on a uniform sized grid. To make it more clear, I've created three identical distance nodes, but each of them have a different setting enabled. So if I attach my Euclidean distance node, which is the original one before this update to the rest of my graph, here's what we're getting. You can see that we're getting a bit more of an organic approach. However, you're left with some interesting artifacts like all of these rocks now pointing to this center here. Now I'm gonna connect the Chebyshev mode and you can see the difference it's given us. And then finally, the Manhattan one. I think we're gonna stick with Manhattan for now. After that, I've used another edge detect to create this stone shape and then use the flood fill nodes to apply a gradient so that they each have different slopes and heights. Again, you can check out this graph on Gumroad, or if you'd like me to make this into a full feature tutorial, leave a comment down below, and I'll be happy to make this into its own video. So I've framed out everything in this graph to divide everything into components. You can see we've got the cracks up here, some micro detail, 
down here we have what I call like this compositing line where I've just added a bunch of my blend nodes in order in a straight line to kind of make it appear like layers in Photoshop, just adding one piece onto the next, onto the next, onto the next. I wanted to take a moment to explain what I've done here with this directional warp frame. All four of these directional warps have the same exact settings. They take this flood fill to random grayscale and push the details in the same direction. In this case, they're all going to the left. For example, if I double click on this warp, you can see if I increase the intensity, all of that detail is now moving to the left based on a varying intensity from these grayscale values. So I've merely taken this flood fill to random grayscale output and inputted it into each directional warps intensity input. You can then multiply this intensity with this particular slider and then put whatever angle you'd like it to go to or how intense you'd like to make it. Remember, you can always type in a higher number than what was originally defined here. Most of the parameters in Substance Designer do that. So now that all of these have been directionally warped, I've run the base height of these rocks through a curve node. So I could direct how these grayscale values are being interpreted through this line here called the curve. I did a previous video on this where we made a picture frame utility node, and I showed you how to make some very intricate detail with just the curve node. Check it out above and in the description below. The idea that I had was I wanted these rocks to slope so that they came up at the tip here. So I just adjusted these gradients so that each rock mainly reached its high peak at the end, as if things are peeling off and getting to the top. Then after that, I carved out my rocks with a shadows node, where I was subtracting that shadow to get a bit more of an organic shape, and then used auto levels to bring all of my grayscale values to a better range that I could work with. Now we come to a really handy new node called the Threshold node. If you've seen any of my previous tutorials, you know that I love using the Histogram Scan node to create masks, which allow us to isolate certain parts of our texture. Substance Designer now has a dedicated node to do this, and it's called Threshold. So to demonstrate what's going on here, I've created this little frame here called Histogram versus Threshold Comparison, and I kind of want to show you the difference between the two. So I've got this auto levels here, and you see I've connected it to the threshold node and to the histogram scan node. Now let me demonstrate that. So if I create a new connection here and I type in threshold, you can see that we've got two options here. And the main one here is this threshold slider. So if I drag this to the right, you can see that it's creating a complete black or white binary mask here. If I drag it to the right and drag it to the left, it's going through that histogram and creating a high contrast mask. So here's where the difference really lies between the two. If I double click on the histogram scan, and if you look up here in the left hand corner, you can see we've got these grayscale values, and that's because my contrast hasn't been put all the way up to the right. If I double click on the threshold, you'll see it's very sharp and also aliased. Now you could fix this by dragging off a connection and adding something like a blur high quality grayscale and then bringing down the intensity. However, with histogram scan, I find that I personally have a lot more control and I can just drag this contrast slider left and right. I've now used this mask after inverting it to drive this blend here where I've created before I have this black and white spots that creates a noise for my ground floor level and then use the levels to isolate it. But I use this mask in the opacity input of a blend set to copy where I could then choose how much dirt I want to cover over the rocks themselves. So if I just take this histogram scan and bring up the contrast, you can see I have a much more fine line here. However, I can also decrease this position slider, causing the dirt to cover more and more of these rocks. You can see I can then increase the position, causing the dirt to stick more on the ground and cover less of these slopes and these rocks. By using these different distances, you can see how you can create some very interesting patterns here. Okay, so this next new node is probably my favorite new feature in this release, and it's called the cross section node. In fact, I made an entire new demo substance just for it. Let's check it out. For my second demo, I wanted to create this procedurally made mountain terrain, where if I go over to this one slider here, I can change the entire mountain range, the river, and the very simple forest that I have here. So what is the cross-section node? Well, 
first off, let me create a Perlin noise. And let me decrease the scale here. Then after this Perlin noise, I'm going to add our cross section node. The cross section node takes your grayscale height information and creates a side profile as if you've looked at it from the side and cut a slice through it. So this is what that looks like. And it's really cool that it has this show helper option here. So if I enable that, you can see this is what the height information is, this grayscale Perlin noise. And if I drag the slider across, you can see the cross section as this line is moving up and down of what this side profile looks like. You can then change the axis and choose the Y, get a cross section this way. And you've also got a bunch of interesting parameters here too. For instance, you can change the height scale. And this is similar to what we do with tessellation and displacement. Just by changing the height scale, you can raise or lower this based on the slider. You can also change the height offset, which doesn't do any squishing like it does in height scale. Now, the really cool features here are with this drawing style dropdown. So right now it's set to solid, but you also have something like line. So using that same information, you can change the thickness of the line. You can change the smoothness of the line where you can make it more of a gradient or less of a gradient. You can change the line style to something like solid or segmented. And you can then see that we're getting these gradient stops here as the line goes along. Or you can make it much smoother by adding a gradient here. The option I decided to go with, though, was this gradient mirrored option. Let me remove the helper here so you can see what's going on. And as I increase this cross section coordinate, you can see that we're creating this sort of oscilloscopy gradient line here. And so that's what I've done with this Perlin noise. I've used the cross section set to gradient mirrored, and I've added a levels here so that I could focus in that information and create this sort of mountain range from above. Then what I did was I added this multi-directional warp grayscale, where it takes four directions of warping this particular noise, and I could choose the angle and the intensity and drive it by a crease noise with this intensity input. I then took a moisture noise and blended it in with our previous directional warp here by using a mask that I created by using a histogram select, where I could pick a particular range in the histogram and grab only the things that I wanted to be florist. In this case, it was mostly everything but the mountain range, because you can see I kind of let some forest grow in here, but I really didn't want many trees here up at the top. I then decided that I wanted to add a river here. So I used another histogram select where I took these grayscale values here and selected one particular range along the side to create something like this. I could then blur it and then use another histogram select to isolate an even smaller part of that river where I could create this sort of river bank that smooths off the transition from the lower part of the river into where these sort of simple trees are. So I did that by blurring that line and then using an auto levels to bring everything back to a more workable range of grayscale and blended that in. To do the color, I basically did two gradient maps, both of which are being stemmed from this same multi-directional warp. So I did a gradient map where I created this very simple brownish grayish tone and mapped that against here to get the sort of height and mountainy look that you're going for. And then for the second gradient map, I've got a greenish, little bit more complex gradient for some trees and then just blended them in together and used the same multi-directional warp as a mask to blend the two. Then to go for a bit of a stylized effect with this river, I took a uniform color set to this bluish color and blended that on. Finally, for one last touch, I did want to set my roughness level specifically to the different parts of the graph. So I took a levels here, and that was just mainly for control if I wanted it to, but I selected my mask that I created from this river section inverted that. And so everything that's white is not going to be reflective and everything that is black is going to be very reflective. And so to dial that down a bit, I blended in a grayish uniform color to sort of choose how rough I wanted the non rough things to be and then continued to keep the river black. I also wanted to add some sort of smooth transition so that you didn't quite go from complete rough to complete smooth with the water. So I just blended in an extra faded in part of this blurred high quality grayscale of the riverbank just to smooth that transition out. And so you can see we've got just a tiny bit of detail here as I rotate the light. And I'm going to switch to iRay so we can get an even better image. 
And the really cool thing about this is it's all procedural, so you could change many different aspects about these mountains. For instance, I could go into this cross section, and like I did before, I could just bring up this value. And so all this has been driven just by this cross section node in that Perlin noise. In addition to that, if I go to the levels that happens right after the cross section, I can bring this in here and I can change how wide and how large these mountains are. Similarly, I can also change the position of this river, where I can bring it further up or down the mountain just by changing this position slider, or if I wanted to, I can increase the range and make the river wider. I can even completely remove the forest and just make it all water if I'd like. In addition to that, Substance Designer 2020.2 improves the experience when exposing parameters. After exposing a parameter, you get a shiny new dialog box that allows you to set up everything then and there, as opposed to having to double click the graph to get to the exposed parameters panel every single time. It also allows you to generate your spherical icons within the app. After double clicking the graph and twiddling down the attributes pane, simply hit generate and Substance Designer will use the built-in PBR render node to create a high quality thumbnail. You can then see this thumbnail in the library in Substance Designer or the shelf in Substance Painter. And finally, performance. While working on some new premium training for you guys, I found a significant performance boost while dealing with 8K textures. 8K textures on a laptop. Algorithmic at Adobe also stated that the output nodes are now computed first, as opposed to having to have all the intermediate nodes compute. So you'll be able to tweak parameters and see the result in your 3D view much faster. And nodes display their thumbnails one at a time now, so they don't have to wait for the entire graph to process first. Thank you, Substance at Adobe. There are a lot of new features and improvements with this update. So if you wanna check out more, you can check out the release notes and all that other stuff in the description down below. These are just a couple that really caught my eye. I hope you really liked this video. If you did, hit the thumbs up. It lets me know that you're watching and that you wanna see more videos like these. And if you'd like to see me create more in-depth tutorials in Substance Designer, where I literally go from beginning to end, from scratch, teaching you along the way why things happen, creating full textures, hit subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when I post new videos. Until next time, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.